Yep, perfect. So Jim already covered our introductions here. Um, you, you know, I, I know you're not here to see us. You're here to uh, just to hear about what's coming uh, in 11.2. Um, with that, I'll just give you a little bit of the landscape of what's going on um, with our community and uh, in Rad Studio. Um, we have seen a, an uptick. I don't know any other way to to say it. An engagement. Um, as you see here, we had a and, and welcome to those of you that are attending uh, after, on the heels of the coding boot camp. We had a, a really successful uh, coding boot camp that had um, over 50 presentations, um, 8,000 registrants, one of the largest that we've done. Uh, if you've been a part of those in the past, uh, thank you for continued attendance. And if you're new to the audience, then welcome. Um, behind the scenes, uh, in addition to Jim, who runs our uh, community engagement, um, we have about 330 or so MVPs and tech partners uh, that are um, you know, working on content, working on tools that that support uh, Rad Studio and the ecosystem that we've uh, that these guys have built, um, and they are as excited as we are about uh, this release. Um, and on that note, we've had a, a lot of uh, registrations, uh, thousands of registrants for this uh, this webinar, uh, just to see what's coming in 11.2, which um, you know normally is not necessarily the case for a point release. Um, not to say the point releases don't uh, don't make an impact, but this one I think there's an uh, extra excitement around, um, especially with the um, the excitement that we've seen on 11 11.0, just the major release having and just so much uh, so much enthusiasm around it, the stability that's seen, the new features that are available, uh, and then the specific release that we launched uh, for C++ uh, the C++ community um, to kind of kickstart our efforts in that direction to. Uh, support C++ development and developers. Um, with that, you know, we have an audience that is long-term and stable, um, but we are always looking for ways to um, attach the value of Rad Studio and Embarcadero to new users and new community. Um, some of that comes in just making features that are better for C++ or better for Delphi um, that attach to newer uh, or nascent technology. But some of that means going out and finding developers where they're at, uh, which is what we've done um, with you know, initiatives like the Coding Bootcamp, um, bringing in younger audiences, but also bringing the power of VCL and FMX to Python developers. Uh, you may have seen some of that uh, information floating around, uh, some links to downloads um, for Python for Delphi, Delphi for Python, um, the PyScriptor IDE. Uh, lots of things that we're trying to attach to in that community because we see the power of the combined ecosystems of Python and uh, the Rad Studio experience. So, um, and Jim will tell you more about that. Um, but it's all in an effort to show value in different places, find new audiences, find new ways to add value across the the ecosystem. Um, and another way we're doing that is uh, just streaming this live uh, to new audiences in Facebook and YouTube. Um, we did that with uh, successfully with the coding bootcamp, and we're able to see you know thousands of of minutes and hours streamed um, across the the week. So really excited uh, about what's going on internally uh, and how we're reaching out externally. Uh, and with that, I'll kick it over to Marco uh, to talk about kind of the development landscape and what's happening uh, out there and how we're how we're attacking that. So thanks so much. Sure, thanks, Kyle. Um, the landscape we are focused on in terms of raw studio is is kind of what's happening in the in in the world around us and, and there are three major trends that have been valid for actually a, a little time and will remain significant for probably the past couple of years the first is the uh, the the focus on windows 11 windows 11 is the new release uh, that is critical for, for the success of the platform. ISO is fully focused on it and improving it significantly over time. So we want to provide the best options for, for Windows 11, both for the traditional SDK and the Windows App SDK. And we've been delivering and will continue to focus on this um, in, the, in the coming future. Uh, the second step is the transition on to ARM. Uh, not only for mobile, which we've been embraced a long time ago, but also for desktop. Uh, now, the main focus was to support macOS ARM, which we've been done um, with 11.0. And um, now we are kind of adding a bit to it with uh, iOS simulator support on that specific uh, macOS platform. 
but we are also looking for the future to further enhance our ARM support on the on the DEX support as, as a native option. The third element that's part of the landscape and we are we are focused on is um, the increased use of high resolution monitors and multiple screens that's true for developers and it's true for for our the end users of the applications you build um so we we know that's important and we spend quite some effort moving both firemonkey and dcl to fully support 4k um, adding support for styles and over the last year make sure that the experience with the RAS Studio ID is a very nice experience on a 4K monitor. It's something you'll see we're continuing working on and we provided further improvements in quality in terms of the 11.2 release. Now, why does it matter? What, what are we doing in broad terms? Uh, there are a few things that are very important in RAS Studio and um, that we continue, continue to be the strong points for the product and the reason uh, behind the product and what we are doing in, in terms of enhancing it. Uh, the first is developer productivity that remains a cornerstone. We want developers to build applications faster. And for example, on multi-device, but also on, on Windows, we do offer probably the fastest experience in terms of development compared to the other tools uh, currently on the market. Um, the ability to design your UI, preview your UI, preview your UI on mobile without even compiling or, or writing a line of code uh, is a tremendous different differentiator compared to other solutions. Um, also, we build fast native applications. Um, uh, fine, yeah, you can reach multi-device with, with JavaScript and HTML, but native applications offer a definitive advantage to, to uh, the end users uh, because they feel and behave like the platform is expected and they're not just browsers in disguise. Um, the last thing I just saw and I want to mention is uh, Skype, which is extremely popular, uh, specifically in Europe. Um, they've gone with a native Windows application replacing the Electron Windows application. That's, that's a sign that a native app does provide an advantage. Um, for for the customers and as as an experience. Now, of course, the other tenets are core to RAS Studio database access. It's part of the design and the architecture from the ground up. The fact that you can consume and use C++ libraries and write them if you have C++ Builder uh, is also a key feature that remains core. Uh, access to all of the APIs throughout all of the many platforms that we support. Uh, the ability to use the Visual Designer, as I mentioned, a very strong community, kind of something Kyle hinted to earlier, and also a huge amount of compatibility with existing code. You can take a 10 years old, 20 years old application and migrate and improve it. Yes, not with zero effort, but compared to what you have to do on other platforms where you don't have the language anymore, you don't have the platform, you have a completely different API, at times, even after a couple of years, not, not 20 years, um, we think this is a huge because it preserves your investment over time rather than every two or three years having to rewrite all of your application from scratch. Now, along these lines, I'm just going to go very quickly of what we've recently done in terms of product improvement because, of course, I think you're all waiting to, to know what's specifically new in 11.2. Um, 11.0 was a release where we embrace 4K monitor support in the ID, so ID high DPI, but also using the VCL designer in the ID. Um, we worked a lot on LSP and C++ uh, code formatter quality. We create a new welcome page that we are further enhancing now. We introduce Visual Studio Code LSP support for Delphi uh, and improvement through the installer. Um, we did a lot of improvements in the tool chains and the libraries. Uh, the thing I want to call out here is Delphi macOS ARM M1 support. I mean, a native compiler for uh, that platform. Now, we enhanced it in 11.1, which was a release particularly focused on quality and, and improvements of the core features provided in 11.0. And, and further with 11.15, where we offered 
improvements to coding site and the LSP experience for the C++ uh, programming language. Now, alongside, we also provide the support for all of the recent version of the operating systems, many of which were not available when, when 11.0 was, was released. So we officially support Windows 11, Mac OS 12, Monterey, uh, iOS 15, and Android 12. That was with 11.1. Um, now, what's coming along with the 11.2 release uh, we are announcing today is Again, a lot of focus on quality and improvements, uh, but also a few nice features, some of them relatively small, but, but nice to have, and, and offering collectively a significant improvement to, to the platform and the IDE. Um, we are, have been working a lot on the ID, um, high DPI experience, with the designers and the ID itself, uh, addressing a very significant number of small issues that were still there. Uh, we improved the ID usability overall with a lot of small things that uh, David in particular will go over in a minute. We improved, we created a few new things in the ID itself. Um, um, Syntax highlighting support for the CPU view when you're looking at the assembly. Uh, markdown support integrated in the ID itself and a revamped HTML editing experience. Improvements to the editor tabs and the ability to customize fonts and styles throughout the IDE. We did a lot of improvements around code inside and the help inside in particular, which is using XSLT again. Um, we have a nice feature of allowing you to disable, to see um, if dev code, uh, if dev out code that is not enabled in the current compilation uh, target platform and so forth, visibly inactive. Uh, and of course, we embedded all of the C++ code inside features from 11.15 into uh, 11.2. Um, we also have a new thing in terms of platforms, which is iOS simulator support for Delphi. Now you can build application for it, um, as long as a new debugger experience for Delphi on the Linux platforms via the LLDB debug engine. We have improved the um, Android APIs to uh, level 32, which is a Google requirement for next November, um, and improved a lot on the debug experience for Win64 C++. We have also done a lot of updates on libraries. I'm not going to list them here. We'll get some of the details later. But of course, focus on quality in the libraries is always critical, and we've spent quite some effort there. And with that, uh, I can let David continue covering the Rust Studio IDE. Uh, David, I think you're muted. I am muted, thanks. Uh, so first off, I, I want to give a, a quick overview of what we did in 11.0 and 11.1 for the IDE and the form designers. Uh, the main feature uh, or, or main big change in 11.0, of course, was high DPI enabling the IDE. Um, Marco, this is on the following slide, please. Um, and that, that gave crisp fonts and uh, you know, very, very clear text in all the windows in the code editor. We added high DPI form designing uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we also added support for displaying multiple VCL styles in the VCL designer. Uh, that's important to us because one of the things about the you know, form design uh, for Delphi in C++ Builder is that you design uh, very close to, to how the ap application will actually look when it's run. And so, um, if you have a styled application, it is good to be able to design seeing those same styles. You can design seeing how, how it will look when it's run. Now in 11.2, we have followed that up with many quality improvements uh, for, for, for high DPI in, in many areas, um, especially in the VCL form designer, uh, but across the whole IDE. And we've also followed that up by turning on using styles in the VCL form designer by default. Um, in 11.0, that, that feature was present, uh, but it was turned off by default. 
At Level 2, we, we've enabled that. And we also have uh, two special styles that, that are used at design time uh, to reflect the Windows light and dark themes. So if you uh, are running Windows and Windows itself is set to a dark theme, for example, uh, then the VCL form designer should, should reflect that. Moving on to the editor tabs in the IDE. Now, when we redid the uh, UX experience uh, a couple of years ago, um, we, we made a lot of UE improvements. Uh, but we lost some information that was carried in the editor tabs. Uh, because not every editor tab is, is actually a code or, or form tab. Uh, there are a number of other different functions that are displayed in the same area in the IDE. Uh, one example is, is the welcome page, of course, which you see every time that, that you open the IDE, but there are, there are others as well. Um, source control, for example. Um, it's really good to be able to differentiate those. When you have a bunch of tabs on screen, you want to be able to easily you know, visually scan with your eyes and, and see um, the, uh, the special functionality. Um, you want to be able to, to differentiate. Uh, similarly, some code is opened while debugging, and by default, unless you change settings, that means those files will be closed when you terminate the app. And some code is read-only. And so in 11.2, we have added symbology for all of that. So all of this should be clear when you look at tabs in the IDE. Uh, by default, uh, in the light theme, normal tabs have a, have a blue color, as, as you're probably already familiar with. Uh, but tabs can have a special color assigned. So for example, the welcome page, as you can see on the screen in the, the top screenshot, uh, is, is a purple sort of color. Um, all source control tabs have, have their own dedicated color. Um, and the same for other types of, of non-code tabs. So you can easily visually scan and uh, spot the, the type of tab that you're looking for. Uh, code open while debugging is displayed in italic and read only code has a, uh, a padlock symbol. And you can also control the behavior of the X, the close button, which uh, has been requested for, for quite some time. Next up is a, a feature that we're, we're very glad to bring and that we, we've wanted to add in the IDE for some time, and that is Markdown support in the IDE. Now, many of you are probably familiar with Markdown, but if you're not, it is a common human readable text format um, that you can open, in, even in Notepad, for example, uh, that has a, a form of markup, which is formatting, um, that can be passed by a computer, but it's also very easy to read as a human. HTML, for example, is not really easy to read because you have to look for opening and closing tags, and you know, there's no guarantee about line breaks actually matching uh, how line break will be rendered and, and so forth. Markdown is very different because it is, is human readable. Um, both GitHub readme's, for example, are, are markdown. And we have added support for rich markdown documents within the IDE. You can see a screenshot there of, of how this looks. Uh, we've also brought back support for rich HTML as well in 11.0 that temporarily disappeared. Uh, interestingly, this means that uh, there is no embedded Internet Explorer in the IDE anymore. Uh, both the HTML and Markdown are pure VCL implementations uh, from the Delphi HTML component library. One really nice feature is that uh, for a long time, you've been able to set a readme HTML file for a project. So when you open a project, it will display a, a, a specific file as, as a readme. Uh, that has been expanded to Markdown support. So if you want to distribute your project to other people, and if you want them to open that project and, and get some information when they first open it, you can configure that for, for a project and use a, a Markdown file for that. Now, related to Markdown, uh, but over on the Delphi LSP side is Help Insight. Uh, now, Help Insight displays information that is generated from XML doc uh, in your source code, and it runs a transform. Uh, so the XML is converted to HTML through a transformation, and that is what's displayed in the uh, uh, hint window. Um, now, temporarily for a while, uh, when we moved this over to Delphi LSP, we had a, a hard-coded transform, and we lost the ability to customize the transformation there. But it is very useful to be able to customize that. Um, there are even some third-party products like Documentation Insight that, that rely on customizing that. And that has returned in 11.2. So we have an XSLT file, which is an XML transform, 
uh, that you or, or anyone else can customize. And that allows you to uh, display what you believe is the important information in any way that you believe is important within this, this window. Now I want to move on to one of the uh, features I've, I've been most excited about actually in the code editor, uh, which is displaying inactive code. Now this is something we've had requested for quite some time and we're very glad now uh, through Delphi LSP, uh, technology we've been using for a couple of years now and uh, actively every release adding, adding more and more features to. Uh, through Delphi LSP, we, we have now implemented inactive code. Now inactive code is code that will not be compiled uh, when you compile and run the application. Uh, it's also referred to as, as if deft out code. Um, now it's very common for source code to contain code that is only compiled in particular circumstances, such as for uh, particular platforms, uh, or it's compiled only if you're in a debug target, or sometimes you might have a, a define or a macro uh, to include a particular feature and you'll toggle that in or out to, to compile your code with that. Uh, and because of that, because it's so common, it's really important to be able to see when you're developing what the code uh, on screen is, is, is actually going to be. You know, are you looking at code on screen that's really relevant to, to, to what you're doing right now? And this is what we've implemented. And code that is not relevant to what you're doing right now, code that is if deft out, uh, will be drawn faded, uh, semi-transparent to the, the background color. And this can be turned on or off, uh, or the transparency changed in the registry. And uh, interestingly, because this is done through Delphi LSP, if you happen to use the Visual Studio Code extension for Delphi LSP, this feature will work there as well. So this is a great productivity feature. Uh, ever since it's been checked in, I've, I've been using it in the IDE, and it's amazing how quickly it just became something I expected and, and then relied on straight away. Uh, really, really glad to, to have it here in, in 11.2. Also on the topic of Code Insights, but on C++, Marco mentioned that we had uh, an 11.1.5 C++ only focused release. And you may not have heard about this if you don't focus on C++. But for those of you who are C++ builder and Rad Studio using C++ customers, 11.1.5 uh, was a release that was purely 100% focused on C++ only, uh, mostly around C++ code insight and code completion with a few other uh, minor, minor tweaks in the IDE. Um, this had a, a large number of improvements, uh, especially around performance, uh, around displaying co-completion, uh, around navigation, uh, such as when you control click uh, to, to go to somewhere. Something interesting about C++ is when you navigate to something, unlike Delphi, there are sometimes multiple potential valid places that you might want to go to. And we now show a, a nice drop down there so you can choose where, where you want to navigate to. And C++ Code Insights needs to be configured for your project and your, your setup. Uh, we had two different options that you can choose for how your project or projects are um, indexed. And we added a third in 11.15. Uh, now the difference between these is both important and complex. And so it's, it's far too much to cover in this webinar. We do strongly recommend that when you use C++ uh, and you want to use Code Insights, uh, to, to, to read that documentation on and, and choose the appropriate one uh, for, for your project setup. Now onto something else completely different in the IDE, uh, CPU, the, the disassembly view. Um, this is just a, a very small feature, but another good quality of life feature uh, uh, related to, to syntax highlighting. Now, assembly code is, is quite hard to read sometimes. Um, and we as an industry have a solution for source code that's hard to read, uh, syntax highlighting, which is intended to help you distinguish and understand what you're seeing on screen. And in 11.2, we've added that for assembly code within the CPU view. You can see a couple of screenshots on the screen there. Uh, you can either make a match the editor colors, so you know, the same colors that you will see in the source code editor, or match the IDE style colors as you choose. So a nice small feature there. Um, but uh, another great quality of life one that, that will help your productivity if you uh, use the, the disassembly view often. And one other thing that we have tweaked uh, in 11.2. Now in 11.1, we added the new native welcome page. And I mentioned for 
in, uh, in the context of Markdown and Help Insight that we had removed Internet Explorer fully from the IDE in this release. It's something we've been trying to do for a couple of releases. Uh, in the past, the welcome page was implemented uh, as, as an embedded web browser. Uh, but of course, we can do something much better in the VCL itself. The VCL is very powerful and, and flexible. And the new native welcome page that we added is VCL based um, and very customizable. You can even uh, write your own uh, custom panes and, and, and show you information in there if, if you want. Now, 11.2, uh, we just made a small addition here which is uh, to, to have a new in Getit pane. And this automatically picks up a feed from Getit for everything that has been added or modified recently. It's just there because the content will constantly change as we update and, and change what's in Getit. Uh, as an easy way to see what's what's there, what's new, uh, maybe, maybe help you discover packages. Now I'll head back over to Marco for the next slide on another Getit feature. Sure. The other thing we added to get it actually is more than one um we added a language filter all of the packages that are available in the system can be for both languages but some of them are specifically usable only in delphi or only in c plus plus like we we host a lot of c plus plus libraries that won't be really usable for someone using delphi only now when you install delphi as a product by or by delphi only or install delphi only same for c plus plus builder um, Getty will automatically filter your co the content. But if you happen to have Ra Studio, although you are primarily using one or the other language, you used to have everything available in the list. Now you can decide that what's your primary language and what you want to search for, and, and that setting is going to be active throughout various sessions of, of Getty. Now the second thing we've been we added is a feature that we still owe you some of the extra documentation even even before the, the release after the release today um it's the ability to use a local package um the same information that you can browse and navigate online can be delivered via a single file and that file is going to contain enough information to not only in, install the package but actually do the various actions and steps for integrating the package with the RAS Studio IDE. So the ability uh, to download a package is handy because it um, allows you to install something on a computer, even if that computer happens to be disconnected from the internet. And what we are going to provide is a lot of the RAS Studio add-on packages where a part of the product, but delivered via get it, they will become available as a download in on my.mrkdo.com. The other option is that you can build your own packages because maybe you are a vendor and you want to experiment with this installation model, or you want to simplify the way you install a bunch of components and even homegrown packages and, and components throughout multiple people of your team. And the it's really a powerful technique. There are over 40 actions available to do things like open a project, install it, um, change something in the registry, add something to the library path. All of these features are available as action as part of the package configuration and can be fully automated. And I think the next slide is back to David. Yes, thanks, Marco. Uh, so another ID enhancements, we, we've added quite a lot, uh, in fact, of all, over, over, over all the 11.x releases. Um, so a couple of you might not be aware of, for example, there's um, you know, the new items dialog will display the available platforms for each item. In 11.2, uh, we made a small tweak where you know, it's very common for people to add data modules to a project. And uh, you can, of course, customize what's in the file new menu. Uh, but we added a data module in there as, as standard, uh, just because it, it, it will help or just save, save a few seconds. Uh, the messages view can now show the errors, warnings, and hints uh, displayed in different colors. You know, red for an error, for example. The compile dialog shows the platform and build configuration. And uh, the thing that I want to get on here uh, really is that, um, and actually Marco, next slide for this one, please, is that although we've just spoken about a lot of features in the IDE in 11.2, um, 11.2 really is a quality release. It's, it's, it's not a feature release. Um, 
in fact, even things like the, the markdown uh, display that we added really comes from some quality work that we were doing that we were then able to leverage uh, for, um, you know, for, for, for implementing markdown. So 11.2 is really best viewed as a, as a quality release because we have changed a, a multitude of small things, small details. Uh, so some of we already mentioned are things like just helping you differenti uh, differentiate and, and easily tell um, what the different types of editor tabs are. Um, or uh, your improvements to, to, to how things are displayed in, in the VCL designer. But on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see a, a vast number of other things that we simply won't have time to cover in this webinar. Uh, but there are lots of small tweaks in the IDE, whether it's things to do with performance or things to do with how we're formatting numbers so that they pick up your locale and they're easier to read uh, to improvements for remote desktop or the information shown in the about box or or many other things uh 11.2 is a release where we have found a, a lot of the uh small but useful things uh that, that, that really help uh your usage and we believe that the combination of all of these small things adds up to uh you know, quite a large improvement just in the experience of, of using the IDE. And with that, I'll hand back over to Marco to cover uh, some of the Delphi changes. Sure, what we have done on Delphi is primarily, I mean, the main feature um, is to enable support for the iOS simulator. This is in all effect a new platform for us, although technically the, the binary that's being built is an ARM 64-bit uh, binary compatible with the new Apple hardware. And still it because the way it's wired and connected and the APIs that are and libraries that are being used is different from either the iOS device itself or the Mac OS um, native platform. Um, the simulator is very useful to have. It allows you to test an application on it uh, very quickly, and um, it is really powerful. But at the same time, uh, it also doubles as the ability to create screenshots and images for different form factors and to test your application at different form factors. Originally, when iOS came out and the early interactions, Apple insisted on having only a couple of different form factors so you could actually afford to have the hardware for for this and, and try it live. But now with all of the various variations and extensions and, and smaller <laughs> devices, it's, it's as rich as the Android ecosystem in terms of uh, different sizes. So you really need to have a simulator to try it out your application with all of the different combinations and the use of the notch and all of the various arrangements of the application on, uh, on a device. So the simulator support is really nice. And the only caveat that is limited to running on the new M1 and M2 CPUs on your uh, Mac OS. Uh, we have decided not to support the simulator on Intel uh, Macs because that's, that's a platform that is rapidly going away given Apple has stopped building and delivering and will soon stop supporting probably with uh, operating system updates, the, the old Intel Max. The other thing we've been continuing working on as after a first initial development in, in 11.1 is our support for some of the security features that the Microsoft operating system provides. We already implemented an ASLR support, the address space layout randomization support for 32-bit. Now in 11.2, we have full support also for Win 64-bit. Now um, that is a great addition and it's part of supporting all of the security features that the platform provides and are often required in the industry to be compliant with um, some of the regulations or some of the requirements that uh, for, for building secure and safe application. Now, what is important to mention here is that when you enable high entropy 
address space layout randomization in Win64, what's happening is that a lot of your pointers are going to be bumped up to, um, to high locations in the virtual um, memory address space. Uh, that means that you have more chances to have pointers that are outside of the integer compatible 32-bit um, pointer space. Uh, that's also true for Windows handles. So in a lot of cases, a Win64 application might have been working even if it wasn't formally correct in terms of pointer management. There is a good chance that when moving to high entropy support, uh, the application will actually start crashing and getting access violation. We've seen it in a few cases with our own code. We've seen it with some third-party code. So we we think this is a great feature to have, but be careful in, in enabling it and testing that all of your pointer management is actually safe and proper. Say again, similarly, when you are managing Windows handles, which are not, uh, cannot be mapped to integers. And that's what we've done on the Delphi side. We do have also a few features on the C++ side, which I'll let David cover. Sure, thanks, Marco. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that we had a, a heavily C++ focused release 11.1.5 recently, and uh, development for that was, was in parallel with 11.2. Everything from that is included in 11.2. So 11.2 includes everything, um, all of that, that work we mentioned earlier, uh, which mainly focused on, on code, uh, code completion and, and code insight. Uh, but of course, there's been a number of other quality things that we have done in C++ as well. Um, across the, the whole compiler toolchain. Uh, a few that are worth pointing out, um, one interesting thing is, is the uh, IO streams performance. It's about four times faster than it was in uh, earlier 11 releases. Um, we've, when, when Delphi adds uh, various record helpers, we, we implement those in C++ as well, and we, we've gone through and integrated uh, quite a few APIs um, that are now available to you. Um, a few other fixes in various areas across you know, the, the linker and your know, options and pass to the compiler and, and more. Uh, really what I want to convey here is just a, a wide variety of areas that have uh, have been looked at. The C++ linker in 11.2 also supports the TS aware uh, data execution prevention and ARCLR flags. Uh, now Marco mentioned high entropy ARCLR for Delphi. Um, we do not yet support the high entropy version for C++, but ASLR in general is, is supported for C++ in, in 11.2. And as Marco noted for Delphi, um, it applies just as much to C++ and that can be important uh, for those of you who make your applications available to those with uh, security policies that require features like this enabled. Finally, we have uh, introduced remote debugging for Win64 in 11.2. Some time ago, we switched over to using LDB for C++ Win64, which made a, a huge improvement in the quality of debugging uh, C++. And we have now enabled remote debugging using that, that same debugger. Uh, the next slide is back to Marco. Yes, thanks. The other area where we did a significant amount of work is on the Android platform support. There is a requirement to move to at least API level 31 uh, for new applications and uh, next November for updates. Um, that's something we want to provide because we were supporting Android level 30 until recently. Now we kind of went ahead a bit and uh, moved to uh, API level 32, which is already available from Google, and that's the version that we uh, support today. Now, notice only one caveat that um, you need to make sure that your Android manifest template is actually updated um, to the latest version if you want to support the, that API level. The manifest does change a couple of settings that, of course, you can manually tweak, but if you are just using an old application that you built in the past um, and just recompile it, you're not going to have the proper configuration for uh, API level 32. 
similarly, if you update your Delphi 11 or RAS Studio 11 from 11.0 to 11.2, because we are not removing and replacing all of the additional doc, uh, doc files in your um, uh, application configuration, uh, that you are pr probably going to have the old manifest as well. So if you're just doing an update, I mean, which is still an uninstall, reinstall, but maintaining compatibility of existing files, you might need to double check the, the XML template you're starting with. The requirement for moving to the new API level is also to in install a new SDK, which is now part of the RAS Studio installation. And the requirement for the new SDK is actually to have at least version 11 of the JDK. So we are also providing um, a new JDK uh, as part of the product installation. So again, uh, you can of course manage, I mean, install your own JDK and your and install the SDK manually. But if you are not, you need to replace the ones that you had as part of 11.0 or 11.1 with the new ones because they are different and they are required for some of the new features um, that that Google basically mandates for, for the store support. Now, this also involves improvements for local notifications, which also need the new manifest and specific settings. Um, there are new user, user permissions. Uh, again, it's something you might have to fine tune in, uh, in your existing application. And we support the new key store model and um, um, encryption level. So. Uh, Overall, there are a lot of new features in the Android API enablement integration. Uh, they're really very nice and provide uh, the, a good experience uh, when targeting the latest devices and the latest API. And with that, I think it's back to David for the LLDB work. Thanks, Marco. So we speak about LLDB fairly often uh, in our release webinars. Uh, over, over the past couple of years. Um, now, a couple of years ago, we had a wide variety of different debugger technologies that Red Studio was using, which would give a very different uh, experience in terms of uh, you know, what features were available or how well certain debugging features worked uh, when you were debugging on, on various platforms. And we've had a, a strategy that we've, we've spoken about uh, several times about uh, moving all of these platforms to a single debugger, LLDB. Now for C++, that was fairly straightforward, uh, but of course we had to add Delphi language support to LLDB. And uh, we have uh, been, been doing that and steadily extending the, the Delphi language support um, every release. And that allows you to do things like evaluate your expressions by, by typing your valid Delphi code and, and, and so forth. Uh, it's important to, to give a, a first class Delphi experience when when debugging on on these uh, these platforms. And then point two extends that further. Um, you can see on the right hand side of the slide there are a number of uh, Delphi language features that we've now added, uh, such as um, pointer casts, for example, or, or understanding empty strings uh, in an evaluation as opposed to a, a string that, that actually contains characters. Um, some basic handling of, of sets and and so forth. Uh, really, the point here, though, is, is just to emphasize that we are continually evolving um, and improving our uh, uh, Delphi language support within LLDB. And on the next slide, uh, we can show you how, how much progress we've, we've really made here, because uh, each release we, we happen to mention or we're using LLDB for, for Delphi on a particular platform. Uh, but this slide shows all of the platforms that we are now using. Um, now, the big change in 11.2 is that Linux 64 has moved to LLDB. Pretty much every release, we have moved one platform over to, to LLDB. 11.2, it was Linux's turn. Uh, one note there, though, is that uh, it does require Python 3 to be installed. Um, and if you have issues with finding Python 3, we have good documentation there about how to, how to configure the, the uh, debugger. With this change to Linux, uh, this means that uh, as of 11.2, LGB is used for quite a wide variety of our platforms. And so we are making great progress uh, in our target to uh, to move to LGB and 
you know, use it as as the single debugger across multiple platforms for both C++ and, and Delphi. And with that, I'll hand back over to Marco to cover some of the uh, libraries, uh, both quality and, and improvements. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to move a little more fast here because well, we have a lot of small details. Um, but And I'm going to touch on, on only shortly on a few things. The online documentation, the doc wiki, which is actually live uh, as we speak, um, has a lot of the details and demos and examples and further information. But in general terms, we've spent a lot of effort, as mentioned, in term to focus on quality, quality improvement. Oh. Okay. Hope it doesn't happen again. Um, the there are a few things that are worth calling out. The first is that we updated Zlib. Um, there was a patch uh, of a vulnerability that's been in Zlib for about 10 years, but was discovered like eight years ago and no one fixed it until recently, but we decided it was worth um, fixing it. And we also did some other pro improvements in terms of quality for the zip support. We introduced a brand new stream class, which is a portion of an existing string. Sorry, if that's your, there's a mistype there. It's the proxy subrange stream. So a stream is just a section of an existing stream. It's then when you want to copy a stream and, um, and you don't have to worry about copying everything, but you only want to copy a section of a string. We have JIT enabled the regular expression engine that we're using. So it's re recompiled with a different setting to make it faster and done a number of improvements on RTTI quality and performance on a lot of core um, system APIs. Um, now, we've also done a lot of work around the VCL library, as, um, as you uh, might imagine. Uh, the focus around VCL, which is in the next slide, um, is on Many smaller things, uh, specifically components that have been introduced or updated over, over recent time, like number box, uh, but also improvements to the uh, split button behavior, the card panel, um, some of the list view overlays, uh, some of the features on the reach edit, and, and so forth. Uh, the thing I want to call out is that we've done some further improvements on the T Web browser edge support. So both for the T Edge browser component and the T Web browser when using Edge, we've added further customization in terms of where you want to have your cache data because Edge does require um, a local cache. And that's something you don't want to have, for example, in your program files folder because it would be illegal. Um, and also you can determine where your web view to DLL is by using the Edge browser executable folder. Uh, property. These are dynamic properties. They've been added. Uh, they will become static. Um, I mean, published in in the next bre breaking release, so 12.0. Um, but again, some of these features apply to both um, TH browser and TWeb browser. Some were already available for TH browser, the native implementation of WebView 2, um, which is Edge, the Chromium version of Edge, available on Windows, and um, the same have been moved over to the T Web Browser component, which has dual support for Internet Explorer or WebView 2. Uh, next slide um, is around FireMonkey, where we spend quite some time on a lot of small things. So again, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but one specific thing that we focus on a lot is path processing. So the path data, the T path component. Um, we've improved the rendering. Uh, we've improved the quality of the rendering, specifically for some of the complex quadratic curves and, and transformations, and also the performance by reducing the number of points that are actually painted on screen for the same for the same path. Um, so that is very significant. It's a huge change compared to uh, what was done in the past across all of the different areas. Again, web browser support with the edge integration, um, style book performance, list view behavior, 
uh, buffer layout improvements and um, generally a lot of quality and performance improvements throughout the entire Pharmaki library. Regarding uh, data and Faradak, um, we have again focused on quality and also cleaning up some of the existing um, drivers for different databases and, and Faradak does support like well, about 20 da different databases natively. We have improved some of the tools and utilities that come along uh, Faradak, which are covered in the next slide. And um, specifically around FD Monitor, which is our tool for, uh, wait, um, sorry, I, I, I got, I was talking about the different slide. <laughs> so we did a few things. Oh no, it's well, it's fine. Okay, so FD Monitor was greatly improved. Um, the other thing uh, with syntax highlighting, um, high DPI support, uh, better SQL output to track commands. Um, also, FD Explorer has been also improved, and the Firedock SQL Editor has full syntax highlighting support and a lot of improvements in, in terms of shortcut keys while you're editing the, the SQL code. Um, there's been an optimization in ADO, um, but the main thing around ADO is that uh, like we've done in the past for BDE and for DB Express, we are providing a migration path for existing DBGO or ADO components. So there is a refined script that you can run to search and replace within your application the name of components and properties that have a matching uh, native Firedock solution. But because this is not always possible, we all also provide a unit, which is called, in this case, Firedock ADO.migrate, which offers compatibility. So an old method in, in ADO that's not in Firedock is available in this unit, so you can actually migrate your code and move it from dbgo from ado to full firedac support in a fairly smooth way and in refine we have also added a nice change which is leaving the old code as a comment so when when we go through an application and we replace our properties components and so forth you can see what was done more clearly because you have a comment with the old code and then the new code being active. <clears throat> in general terms, in Firedock, we've also updated the ODBC driver for Microsoft SQL Server and also providing support for SQL Server on uh, macOS M1. We've improved the transaction support for MongoDB and done a number of, of changes and improvements and quality fixes throughout the library. The next and almost last slide in terms of details <clears throat> is around RAT server and the HTTP and REST support. Um, there specifically, we worked on the proxy support and the HTTP client SSL certificate support for the Android platform, um, and some improvements on the client side for MAM types and multi platform data. The RAT server specific change involve well making RAT server light really work as as designed because we still had a hard coded user limit that shouldn't have been there. Uh, so now RAT server light has unlimited users, although it hasn't got unlimited performance. Um, we've improved the logging. Uh, now the logs include IP address and date time, so it's easier to go through logs and understand what happened and and what's the trouble. We've making it more flexible to customize the configuration for FIDAC connections by allowing you to specify a custom path for the FIDAC configuration files, the def connection definitions and drivers. And we have also improved some of the mechanisms for managing the session token um, and simplified the development of client-side application when using the Firedock, the MS Firedock client. The advantage there is that you can use that component to create a in-memory data set with the persistent with, with the proper fields, metadata, 
at design time. And so you can create persistent fields uh, at design time and have everything configured in the designer without having to, to write any additional code. And with that, um, uh, we can kind of summarize the quality work that was done by indicating some of the numbers in terms of, of quality work. Uh, overall, we addressed uh, over 450 quality portal issues, um, including 30 new features requested by customers and uh, for more than 420 bugs. Now, a couple are still pending final verification, but it's only a handful, actually. Um, now, that doesn't include duplicates and things that are won't fix or, or they're not relevant anymore. These are really fixes that we have done in the, as part of the product development. Now, if we look at the internal numbers, the internal numbers are much higher. That's why you can, I mean, if you, if you add everything in the bottom section, it's more than, than what's listed above because the total number of issues addressed uh, goes across product areas and goes across um, different types of, of, of reasons for closing a bug. Um, the ID was the area where we had more issues fixed and then the Pharmac and VCL libraries, but also uh, the RTL, the data and the compilers had a lot of issues uh, fixed and uh, significant improvements in terms of quality. Uh, with that, I think we can wrap up by sp spending two minutes on additional initiatives that are related with the product. The first is the Uppercept AWS SDK for Delphi. Um, we have been continuing updating it uh, even after the 11, the initial release and even after 11.1. It generally gets a release every couple of months. It's becoming a full-blown and complete SDK for managing all of the um, Amazon Web Service APIs. Um, a new version is actually expected later this month. And, and more will, will come uh, later this year. Um, if you haven't been following it, it's actually very relevant and it's a very nice and powerful library, which is limited to, uh, it's available only to enterprise customers. Now, the other initiative is what Kyle hinted at and they are around Python. And I just want to uh, underline the fact that there are two primary goals, uh, although there are many sub goals and it's a very complex ecosystem, but the two minor primary goals in my, on my point of view is first provide Python developers, and there are many out there, with a nice way to un unlearn about the fact that Delphi exists and has great UI libraries and also great capabilities that they can use to enhance their Python applications and maybe they will decide to use Delphi over and over more for, for part of their development. And the other angle, which is equally important, is for Delphi developers to allow them to use Python libraries without even having to learn Python and the ecosystem, but be able to use some of the most powerful Python libraries for artificial intelligence and big data management out of the box, just staying within, within Delphi. But uh, Jim can explain a bit more some of the details here. But you're muted. I'm muted again. Thank you, Marco. This is an overview of the ecosystem we have. Uh, essentially, it's split into two parts. We have the for Python developers up at the top, which is where we have the PyScriptor IDE, which was developed by Kira Alcos, the same guy that uh, from Python for Delphi. And we've added in the Delphi FMX and Delphi VCL libraries for Python developers, as well as the app builder that lets you build. Uh, Python applications for Android, which is really quite impressive. We just recently added debugging support to that as well. And we have the export. We're still sharing the older slide. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Now it's visible. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So the top here is the for Python developers. Um, and the exporter here that gives you the ability to design your UI in Delphi. Take advantage of all the great Delphi. GUI design and export right to Python. And then down here, this is the part that probably most of you are really interested in, is the Python environment wrappers. Um, and this is really cool, and it actually has been expanding quite a bit since we first released it, so that you can just take popular Python libraries, and um, we've got 
about a dozen of them imported now and working on an automatic import system. And it turns them into a component. You drop it on your form. It You could automatically have it uh, encapsulate all the Python stuff. So you don't have to think about Python at all, right? All you have to do is say component, component, and then write Delphi code or eventually C++ code and act, use these libraries, uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, NumPy, et cetera. So it, it is really quite amazing. There's a huge, huge, huge ecosystem of components out there for Python developers. And uh, yeah. So here's the list. I'm not going to go through all these. I, I mentioned them in detail on the previous slide. But um, <clears throat> yeah, you can find more of these up on GitHub. If you go to GitHub, uh, look for the uh, um, P4D data sciences might be a good place to go check it out, and you can find some of those libraries we have up there for that. And with that, I think I'm going to go on to the next slide, which is the final slide here. So there's Marco. Sure. Um, just just a, as, as as a summary, I mean, I won't I won't read those all of these again. We have really focused on creating a very nice developer experience with the new features in Rust Studio 11.2, especially around the IDE and the small things that, that make sense and, and matter a lot to the day-to-day -day experience using the product. We have enhanced uh, the platform support with iOS Simulator, um, improved the debugger experience specifically on Linux, uh, provided better uh, Android platform integration, and overall, added a lot of features that we think are relevant for customers and uh, provide um, better quality and uh, a faster uh, IDE and faster applications once one uh, after you build them. So overall, we're very happy about the release and, and we think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Uh, it is technically available. Um, I think the downloads are actually on myembarkade.com, and I think the trial is actually working on on uh, Embarcadero. Uh, so feel free to start looking into it. And in the meantime, we do have a little extra time to um, answer your question. So uh, we'll stick around and. Um, let us know what you think, both here and, and later on, uh, directly over email or reaching out on social media. There are a lot of questions already, but if you do have questions, uh, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, come to the GoToWebinar stream and you can put questions in the question panel and we'll do our best to get them answered, but there are a, a lot of questions here. Um, actually, the first two that just came up is um, about roadmap and what's in the next 11 point What's after 11.2 release, Marco? Um, if... um, as, as a company, well, we don't want to openly discuss roadmaps. We are continuously monitoring the platforms that we target and potentially new platforms or variations of platforms. Um, we are also focused on improving our overall C++ compiler experience with, um, with a major initiative that's going to take some time to uh, be released and become available, but it's something that we are committed to uh, improve the um, C++ compiler in a very significant way. Um, and um, again, focusing on quality and improvements and, and a lot of this continuing on these small details and small, small change that matter. And feel free to let us know what you specifically want or like, and um, we'll try our best to um, uh, provide, I mean, a good solution for your request. There's a question here from Michael about Python for C++. So a lot of the stuff we've done does work with C++, working on expanding the documentation and improving that, but um, it, it's, it's moving really fast right now. So I don't know what all works in C++ and what doesn't. But the goal is that we are uh, targeting Delphi first with an eye on how we can make sure it works on C++ as well. Is the markdown component, the new markdown functionality, Marco, that was added as a um, to the IDE, is that also available as a component that developers can use, or is it only a feature in the IDE? I can answer that one. Uh, okay. No, it is in the IDE only. So uh, we, we license a third-party control made by uh, Dolphy HTML components. 
um, but that's licensed only for use within the IDE by, by us. Um, if you want to have Markdown support in your apps, then uh, you, know, you can, can check out uh, third-party controls. Yeah, that's a great component. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so as far as upgrading, there's a few people that asked about this. If they have 11.x installed and they want to install 11.2, uh, someone commented that they tried doing it and that they had an error message from Parnassus components. What's the best recommended way to do that as far as moving from an 11.x to 11.2? Um, the, the experience is not as smooth as, as we wish we could create, um, specific, specifically with gated packages, because what happens is that um, you have to uninstall and reinstall. Now, it, it's driven by the same process. So there is an uninstallation that's happening uh, that would take care, uh, as, as the default, which we still recommend, um, which takes care of making, keeping all of your registry configurations and all of your third party components um, already available and installed and make make sure they still show up when when you are migrating from for example 11.1 to 11.2 now there is a small issue with the get it packages uh, only and the small issue is that as part of the uninstallation they get uninstalled but because the registry settings are preserved the registry thinks hey you have the components but in fact you don't have them um, so there is a way through the migration wizard to automatically install the components that have gone lost um, it is not trivial so it might end up being faster just to manually reinstall the components so if you know the components you had from get it um, after you have reinstalled, just go and re-download um, Konopka, Parnassus, uh, other other components, and and you'll be set. Um, we are planning to significantly improve the experience, making it fully automatic to uh, get your back your your current get components working. But it's something that we hope we'd have for 11.2, but it's, it's not there. Thank you. Uh, there's a few questions about other platforms. It, interesting, someone's, I, I see a few people asking about Android Intel, which I guess the Android Intel devices, the mobile devices have been discontinued, but suppose some people are still running Android on like a desktop computer, um, which I believe it has an emulation in there for running ARM applications. I'm not sure if that's something we're planning to target. The other one I see people asking about is uh, Raspberry Pi ARM Linux, which I, of course, would love to see as well. Uh, Marco, is that something that either of those something we're thinking about? Or I know we can't commit to anything, no, but. It's... Yeah, yeah, no, we can't commit anything, but we are definitely thinking about, as I mentioned at the beginning, additional ARM platforms, including additional ARM desktop platforms. Now, there aren't that many on the table. So, I mean, the current ARM platforms that we don't support are. Windows and Linux, basically. <laughs> so these are the two, again, no promise and no commitment in any sort, but it they are two platforms we are actively uh, considering and looking into for uh, the future. Now, the transition Apple did uh, on the desktop side from Intel to ARM was very fast, very quick and and, so that became our priority. But Microsoft is committed to, to ARM on desktop. And so that is a platform that is certainly relevant. Now, the Intel Android, uh, I, I think it's, it's basically almost, almost disappeared over the last couple of years, although it was relevant some time ago and we were considering it. Um, the other thing is that the Android subsystem for Windows actually seems to be working pretty nicely with the ARM application because it has, it, I think it uses the old lib Houdini, uh, the, the emulation layer from, from Intel. Um, and so that is an opportunity if you want to run Android applications directly uh, on your desktop, even if your desktop is, is an Intel uh, machine. Um, we don't officially support it, we're considering it. Um, we are also 
done a lot of testing to make sure everything works smoothly with the Linux system for for Windows. And, and Jim has done webinars and a lot of, a lot of um, activities around them. That that's another platform that is nice to have support for. So David, there's a question here about the structure window that shows classes in a tree structure. Is there a possibility to collapse all the nodes in the window by a shortcut? Um, Stefan's asking. Offhand I, offhand, I can't remember a shortcut. Um, I would have to go, go look that up, but I think it's a nice feature if we don't have it. Um, if, all our shortcuts are documented in the help. So I, I would suggest just putting a, a feature request. It's, it's a really nice idea. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you, anybody that has, there's a few people that are asking about features. Uh, Quality.embarcadero.com is the place to put feature requests. Uh, uh, we appreciate you sharing them here, but the the best way to make sure they get seen as far as in the future is to put them on quality.embarcadero.com as well. Uh, there's a few questions about C++ uh, platforms as well. Android C++ 64-bit, David. Um, is there anything you want to say about that? Um, yes, I saw several questions about uh, about that and, and about Linux as well. Um, I'm afraid we have no news we can share on that at the moment. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I was trying to scroll through here and some of the questions trying to find the ones I haven't answered yet. A lot of people uh, excited about the new features. I agree. The feedback I've gotten from MVPs and tech partners as well has been very positive that they they like to see all the uh, quality improvements, which is fantastic. Um, so there's a few people asking about running on a Windows on a MacBook Pro M2. So I've had good luck with running on a M1 running parallels with Windows inside there. It's technically not officially supported from Microsoft or Apple. They will say that's not a platform combination they officially support, but it worked for me. I, I would say 90%, including the Delphi, worked on there uh, just fine in that situation. But just be aware, it's not officially supported and there may be a few corner cases that don't work great for that. Um, so for the simulator, is there an Android version of simulator? I know Marco, you just mentioned the Android subsystem or Windows subsystem for Android, but what about Android simulator directly? No, we don't support the emulators for for Android. And the, the over, I mean, since the beginning, that's been not as nice of an experience compared to the iOS side of things. Um, Android, I mean, Google has made several attempts to improve it with different different outcomes. Um, in the past, I've used some of the platform emulator, for example, BlueStacks, and now you can also use the, the, the Windows subsystem if you want to run something locally on, on, on a Windows Intel PC. Um, but they are not really the same smooth experience as the, as the uh, Apple iOS simulator provides, to be honest. Not that I'm really a big fan of uh, Apple, but in this case, there is a significant difference on their advantage in the in the developer uh, productivity and experience. David, there's a question here about a source code control integration from the IDE, uh, Team Foundation Server, Git, GitHub, et cetera. What, what kind of options do we have in the IDE for that? Currently, we support uh, Git's version and Mercurial in the IDE, and so you know, through, through Git support, you can uh, you have access GitHub or GitLab, for example. Uh, we don't have TFS support directly, but um, uh, the API for all our source control is, is part of the tools API. Uh, so uh, you, you can add uh, support for any source control system uh, that you want uh, via, via a plugin. Now, there's a question here about the different JDK options, Eclipse, Adoptium, Adopt Open JDK. What's the best? And then you uninstall. How does that work? I'm not sure who the best of that answer would be. Uh, I mean, all of them are good. Uh, we decided to support the, um, well, it's called Temurin now. It was was used to be called Adoption. It's still called Adoption. 
the naming there is a bit confusing, but basically Adoptium is this um, open JDK consortium primarily backed by Microsoft and Google, I would say, but there are other big companies in it, but they decided to shift everything towards Eclipse. Um, and so now it's part of Eclipse and so Eclipse rename it, but it's basically the same same code base and the same, um, and the same option. So um, what we provide now in Rust Studio is a JDK, which has a totally different name from the one we had in 11.1, .1, but it's basically the new version of the same of the same JDK. Honestly, Rust Studio does not use the JDK in any way. So it it's a, like an indirect requirement. Um, the Android SDK is, I mean, a lot of the tools are written in Java and require a JDK. And because Rust Studio can invoke the Android SDK, for example, to do the code signing, to do some of the operations to deploy to your device, um, then indirectly, I mean, you need to have a JDK on, on your machine, only if you're building for Android. If you're not, if you're not targeting Android, you can, you, you don't need it in any way. Um, so in the, what, what do you need is a JDK that is compatible with the Android SDK. And unfortunately, Google does not provide a list. They say, oh, use what you want, or kind of recommend using Adoption because it's what they are promoting and pushing. So kind of indirectly, that is their recommendation and we just follow it. David, uh, maybe this is a question for you. The, I seems like I recall this being possible before, but I haven't looked at it in a while. If you have where you're building a multi-tier system where you have both a client and a server, for example, RAD server and a Delphi client, is it possible to debug both of those at the same time or or trace from one into the other? I think you need to run two different instances of the IDE. Oh, okay. Yeah, you would have one of those that runs each each tier and uh, debug both at once. Okay. You cannot currently sort of trace from one to the other, as in in the ID and trace from, let's say, client to server as two different processes. Um, what are, are the limitations of RAD server light, Marco? Um, primarily, the limitation is that it runs on uh, the embedded uh, in the HTTP. Uh, server and it uses um, embedded version of interbase. Um, so there's no hard coded limitation, but the limitation comes from the fact that the 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 database used behind the scene is basically single threaded, uh, and the in the HTTP server is okay, but it's not as powerful as as creating like an Apache module or an IIS module with IOCP and some of the other fast performance HTTP operations. So we think it's going it's going to be fine. And if you have like 100 customers here, I'm no more than a dozen online at the same time uh, without creating a ton of traffic, it's going to be handled handle that properly. Again, there's no like artificial limitation. It's just the arch architecture, which is is more limited. Compared to RAD server, you can install over, I mean, using a full version of Interbase, which of course allows multiple connections and multiple operations at the same time. Um, you can deploy it on multiple machines. So you have to have two Apache server with the module, um, and then you can load balance your Interbase server behind the scenes. I mean, the fact that it's a single executable with everything in it or, or DLL loaded, makes it a little less powerful, but it makes it extremely simple to deploy. Um, and so if your requirements in terms of throughput are not terribly high, it is a very good solution. Okay. Um, the question here, I, I think this was addressed earlier, is the um, Binary compatible between the DCUs compatible between 11.2 and 11.x. Yeah, that is the have... goal. Yeah. And <laughs> um, that is the goal. And uh, besides some very, very limited corner cases that we don't think anyone is going to bump into, um, we have done extensive testing on DCU compatibility and um, we think we're good. So DCUs and BPLs and, and runtime packages. 
um, should be compatible across all the 11x uh, releases. Now, um, this might not be something that could be answered directly, Marco, but is there a 11 point, another 11 point X planned or is 11.2 probably the final 11 point X or? Um, we haven't really detailed what's, what's coming next. So I'll, I'll leave that as a surprise for the moment. And then there are people asked about Community Edition, which is currently available 10.4 Community Edition. Is that still being continued? What does the future of Community Edition look like? I don't know if uh, I don't know if Kyle is online and he wants to speak about it. Oh, he might be not. Um, oh, it looks like Kyle's the not current here. thinking is we'll plan releasing an 11, 11 Community Edition before we go to 12.0. Uh, now, it's the current thinking, so again, no promise. Um, we PMs will be eager to get it out, but there are some business considerations to be taken into account. Are there any, if, as far as documentation and help goes, were there bugs or improvements made to the documentation system or the help? I'm I mean, not really sure what that would refer to. I mean, the, the help system is still still the same help system. Um, perhaps whoever asked that could could you write in another question with with a bit more info what you're what you're looking for there, please. Um, I think let's see. Uh, high DPI form designer. I'm not sure what this question is. Just says needs to be addressed. There is. There were some improvements to that, weren't there, David? I think you remember you hearing say, saying you saying something about the form designer for high DPI. Yeah, very much. I mean, um, although we spoke about some features quite a lot in this webinar, really, 11.2 is a quality release, and a lot of work went into the VCL form designer in this release as well as as part of that. Um, I saw several questions about the form designer, um, and the general answer is yes, we've we've done a lot of quality work in it. Um, there are some questions about still designing at 96 DPI. And that's something we're looking into and researching if or how it's possible. And it's not something we've implemented yet. Um, the VCL is, of course, closely tied to the Windows API. And um, you know, Windows doesn't really allow having a child window scaled differently to its parented window. Um, we're, we're looking into what we can do there. What we tend to recommend for developer teams is that in the options dialog in the form designer page, you can choose a specific DPI that you design at. It doesn't have to match your screen DPI. And that means that if some of you are running low DPI screens or some have very high DPI screens or you know, someone uses 150% and someone else uses 200% or something like that, you can pick one and all have the same setting across your team. Uh, and then everyone will, will be able to design it at the same DPI. And we do recommend doing that because uh, you know, we recommend avoiding DPI changes uh, where, where possible. Um, so there's some questions about contacting sales for updates and renewals. If you go to embarkadero.com, that's the best place to go for that. Um, and if I, I don't know if there's a better way, uh, David or Marco, if you have any suggestions on how people can better find that. Um, no, I mean, conduct any, any of the channels uh, in company terms and, um, yep. Um. There's a question here about the IDE being 64-bit, and I know it's still 32-bit, but I believe there were some changes made to take advantage of, like, additional memory or something like that. Is that accurate? Yeah, we get questions about this reasonably often, um, and we can't share specific plans, although it's something we, we look into. Um, several years ago, in fact, uh, I think we turned on so it could access the, the whole four gigabyte uh, memory space. And uh, another thing we've done is that some components, such as you know, code completion being the best example, has been moved uh, out of process. Uh, when code completion was inside the IDE process, it often used hundreds of megabytes of memory, and we moved that out to Delphi OSP. Uh, so, so there are things like that that we have done that you know, reduce strain on, on memory and that kind of thing. 
on the other hand, we do know we're going to have to move to 64-bit at, at some point. Um, I can't share anything about plans here, but uh, you, you can be sure it is something we uh, we are tracking. All right, the uh, go to webinar just moved me to the top of the list again. I lost my place. Um, if there was questions that either of you saw that you wanted to address, David, did you have anything that I missed maybe you wanted to mention? Sure. Um, I think while we're in the Q&A, some of you may have seen me sort of look down a lot, although I was trying to just look at the comment just because I was busy answering questions, which I didn't really mention to do during the, the presentation itself. <coughs> Pardon me. So if you, for example, said hello and only just got a hello reply back, that was me, um, uh, as well as many of the other other questions. Although um, we, we've had a, a team online answering lots, uh, and thank you to to them. Um, there are a few questions that I've seen. So one is about our Markdown HTML support, um, asking or, or concerned that if we use Delphi HTML components, can you also use it and you install it in parallel? And and, and yes, absolutely. We have a special ID you only build um, is completely isolated from components that you install. So feel free to you know, install that uh, as a component in the ID as you, as you normally would. Um, another question was about the layout we saw on the ID welcome page uh, and whether um, you know, kind of dashboard modular thing and, and whether that's available as a, as a VCL component. We, we built that in the VCL, and the layout is actually just a standard uh, grid layout. I think it's T grid layout, or I can't remember the name of the component now, but one that we've had for quite some time. Uh, and then the panes are simply implemented as, as frames, and they, they have a common implementation, so they have a common look and feel. Uh, but I think it was, a, it was a fairly straightforward implementation there. So there's no special component uh, that, we, that we have. We've uh, simply built that using, using um, existing VCL features. Um, well, there's a, there was a question as well. Uh, sorry, Jim, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying a couple people have asked when quality portal is going to be updated with the what's fixed and what's not fixed. Uh, there is a list on DocWiki, which I put in the chat, but that usually takes like a day, Marco, or is there, you know, when that's going to be updated? Um, not today because I, <laughs> I do it and I don't think I'll have enough time. Uh, so it's most likely tomorrow. It, 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 it is almost completely automated. But not fully that it requires a bit of a bit of manual oversee and because including the the bugs with other types of solutions it's it's over 800 it does take a little to 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 check everything is smooth before before pushing the button um so expect the various operations on 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 qp including the new version being available to report bug against and so forth uh, be done by by tomorrow or friday at the at the latest Okay. David, did you have something else you're going to add? Uh, sure. Yeah, I was just scrolling through questions until you uh, found where you were again. Um, so feel free to take over. But the, the one I'd got to was a question about recompiling the C++ RTL. We ship the RTL source. Um, and there was a readme on that uh, ship with the source. Um, the C++ RTL is fairly complex and it's not, not super easy to, to recompile. Um, and if you have issues, just, just drop me an email. We're always happy to you know, try and try and help if we can. Um, our emails are, are on screen currently. Yes, there's a question here about moving from 32-bit to 64-bit application. Um, there is a, I put a link here to the doc wiki for that. I don't know if there's any, there's probably, I know we have webinars and stuff as well on our YouTube channel. And I don't know if the migration um, center has that, I don't know if anybody, oh, Migration Upgrade Center. It looks like it does, so I'll put that link in here as well. Um, David, here's a question maybe you can answer. Any plans or possibility of mixing VCL and FireMonkey? I think that one might be better for Marco, actually. Okay. That's all right, Marco. Uh, sorry, I missed it. I was answering uh, another question. Uh, plans or possibilities of mixing VCL and FireMonkey in the same project? Uh, that is that is a tricky one uh, because VCL and FireMonkey use different message loop uh, with um, significantly different roles. Um, it is technically possible, but there are a lot of things that would get broken. And the issue in 
changing it is that we'll need to change the DV cell message loop that's been very stable over time. And, and so the risk of regressions are significant. It's something we might want to get another look to in the future, but for now, we recommend using a DLL binary uh, if you want to um, if you want to go in that direction, um, or you can be bold and just just merge them. It does work, but you'd have a lot of misbehavior at the uh, application object level, and so things that are driven by the application logic, like hints, shortcut keys, and other stuff, would get a bit a bit unstable. I guess if they wanted to make their own message loop to handle the dispatching between the two, maybe. Oh, sure, sure. Everything is possible. But the, 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 if you look at the message loop for either, they are very complicated and um, they, they, it's non standard. It has a lot of specific use cases, like things like model dialogues and other things that have their own loops need to be taken into mm -hmm. account. So it is, it's something there was an attempt to, to work on a few years back and it, it wasn't working. I mean, the quality was really, really uh, troublesome, so it was it was stopped. And a few questions about specific bugs being fixed. Um, we would need to have the quality portal number and look in the list of fixed bugs, which is in DocWiki. Uh, I can put that in the chat window here again. Um, I don't think I don't think Marco has memorized all of the issues that were fixed. <laughs> uh, uh, we try, but. Uh... <laughs> I mean, as Marco mentioned, we fixed 800 different bugs this release, and uh, out of those, sometimes difficult to remember every every single one. So uh, again, we're getting some more people asking, well, what's the best way to migrate from 11.x to 11.2? Um, I would suggest using the uh, my, what is it, the migration settings migration tool to migration back up your tool? registry. Yeah, back up your registry with that. Yeah, with the migration tool, you can capture the setting. If you use it, make sure, I mean, it has different working modes and, and the UI as well can be improved. Um, make sure you pick migration because depending if you want to move your configuration to a different computer, to a different version of Rust Studio or to an update of the same version, uh, there are different defaults. So you should make sure you pick a migration to an update of the same main version number. Um, you might also want to review the individual uh, registry categories that are that are being taken into account. Um, and on top of it, it will um, capture additional configuration files that are shared um, for for the version. So the migration tool is the most detailed solution, but as I mentioned earlier, it is not trivial, so be careful in what you're doing and um, and make sure you kind of read the documentation and, and follow the steps. Um, and, and that, yeah, it can also, uh, it has a feature that I failed to mention earlier to actually reinstall the guided packages you had installed. Uh, I, I don't know. It, I don't think that is terribly reliable, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the 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 main configurations would would work fine. There's a comment here. Someone said that they really really want to use Rad Server, but unfortunately their company requires them to use SQL Server. As far as I know, Rad Server works with any database you want to use. Is that right, Marco? Well, yes and no. I mean, for your business data, yes, you can use any database. I mean, you can just use FireDoc or a different data access layer and, and use whatever. It There is a requirement to use Interbase or the embedded version, if you want, for the specific data that Rust Server manages, like the user's data, the data captured for um, analytics, uh, um, what else? Well, it's not much more. Permissions and so forth. Those are stored in, in an interbase database. We've been considering opening up that information so you can support any DB, but because we do use some triggers and some low-level mechanisms, that's it is a significant amount of work, but in theory, there's nothing preventing um, using in full a different database. But again, for your company data and business data, they can stay on any system. It does they don't need to be in the same on the same database that use used for 
to drive and and process the the users and permissions and 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 uh, analytics david there's a question here about uh rearranging the welcome page cards in 11.2 that's a wonderful coincidence because i was just writing an answer to that oh, yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an edit button on the bottom left of the welcome page, and that opens a, uh, a layout editor. And in that, you can, like, there's this sort of wireframe representations of, of each frame. You just click on to select it, and it'll show you buttons to you know, delete it or expand it. Um, I know it's basically you have these sort of plus or minus buttons to make it ex you know, expand across rows or columns um, and arrow buttons so you can move it. Um, and uh, you can also edit the number of rows and columns that, that are available in, in the welcome page. So basically you can make a grid of any size and then make a frame uh, take up any you know, arbitrary rectangle uh, within that grid. Has FireDAC, Marco, been validated against SQL 2019 yet? I think so. That is actually part of this release. We updated some of the support with the new ODBC driver and, and so forth. Okay. Um, let's see. I think that, oh gosh, we keep coming. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Marco, what's the process for people getting their own libraries added to Git it? I believe, isn't there, Git it now has like a page for that, doesn't it? Um, yeah, Git it has, there is a page where you can, if you go to Git it now, uh, there is a page with information on how to submit a package. Now, um, once we release the, uh, some of the documentation around the local packages metadata, you might want to play with it and build your own configuration, I will still need to receive it and, and well, make a few change because the formats are not identical. The server-side format and the one you see locally has some minor differences. But the actions, the operations you can do for installing and uninstalling, those are the same. So once we release that information, you'll be able to create your own a local package and then potentially submit it to us. And if we agree that is worth for other customers, we can we can publish it and make it available. The other thing that's coming along, and um, it's not tied to 11 to release, but I think we built the entire infrastructure and we'll soon start rolling it out, is a mechanism for libraries, for open source libraries on Gatit to be able to pick um, the, a new update directly by updating a this kind of a similar configuration file as part of a, of a repository. So suppose you have your your package on GitHub, um, you can make a change to the file, to that JSON file, say, hey, there is a new version, version 3.52. Um, and this is the link for, for a download from GitHub itself. Um, and at that point, get it should automatically refresh the version on the server and uh, well, let anyone know by adding it in the updates list that there is a new version available for, for the package you have installed and, and do a quick uh, uninstall, reinstall by downloading the new package. So we are, we are automating some of that process. It's, um, it's going to take us a little extra time, but the infrastructure is there. So we need to make some experiments and then we'll, we'll uh, extend the offer to anyone who has a library and get it. There's a question here about importing C sharp assemblies. Is that still something that's in Delphi? I don't think is that still there. Well, you can import them as as with through the com object interface. That's the only thing that's available, uh, which is limited, but it can make the trick in in a number of cases. Uh, if not, you need to go use third party tools that provide uh, C sharp and .NET compatibility to Delphi. Like the RAM objects ones, and I mm -hmm. think there might be others. Um, IDE, the yeah, the IDE is written in VCL, not FireMonkey. Um, 
are there plans to bring the T open dialogue and T save dialogue functionality to uh, Android FireMonkey? Is that something? It doesn't. I don't know that it makes as much sense on Android, really. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. We'll we'll have to think about it, but yeah, if there's a, I mean, if you can elaborate on what you expect that to look like, put that in Quality Portal, you know, because we do have the camera roll picker, which would be an open. But um... yeah, and consider that the coming version of Android 13 really restricts terribly what you can see in terms of files on the. Uh, uh, on your device for security reasons. So, um... yeah, that, 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 that's the thing I've noticed is that every version, new version of Android seems to make it harder and harder for applications I used to do that. Well, it's coming um, on Windows as well. So, <laughs> yeah, Mac OS already did that. Every time I, every time I install a new version of Mac OS and then I open a program, it's like, I have to accept like every folder it wants to read. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there's a couple questions about game development. I don't, there's not really anything we have planned specifically around that. I know there are a number of third parties that have great game development libraries. Um, David, here's a question. Are there any plans to add code block folding um, into the editor? For example, begin, inch, try, accept. Try, etc. Uh, so that would be expanding, uh, like which, which syntax elements are, are regarded as as foldable. Um, that's, that's a good question because it's something we have been discussing even in the in the past few weeks. Don't have any specific plans right now, but it's the kind of thing where perhaps you can email me about you know what your code looks like and why you would use it, and um, you know we'll integrate that into our our planning. All right, we are coming up here. It's a quarter tell here, so we'll probably wrap up pretty quickly. Uh, I'll, there's a lot of people, very positive comments here saying, um, appreciate Delphi and the whole Embarker team. It gets better and better every year. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, this is, I, I think, is a really great release. I'm excited about it and definitely getting a lot of good, uh, um, a good feedback from it as well. So. Oh, the IoT packages. I oh, I, I even saw one person in the, in the Q and A list um, uh, who had it installed already, and uh, was testing it. I was very happy. So um, you're you're very fast. <laughs> uh, good good work there. Oh, and for those looking for it, uh, my dot .com is our general download portal for uh, your know, installations and other files like that. Yes, yes. And our email addresses are still up on the screen here. Uh, Kyle had to jump, but you know, there's his email address and all of ours as well. And uh, we can certainly do our best to follow up with you via email. Now, I'm, I'm not particularly certain if we said, and maybe we did, and I simply missed it because I was concentrating on something else. Uh, but we may not have mentioned that 11.2 is actually out right now. Did we mention That's that? That's true, yes. 11.2 is out right now. Uh, you can go yes. and download it and install it. We made it live during the webinar. Um, so that uh, now you've, you've seen the webinar, please go ahead and, uh, and upgrade. Yes, if you're watching this, even in a replay, it's still out. It's out already. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're watching it in two years, maybe there's something new available, but that, that's a that's good deal. <laughs> so go, go to yeah, embarkadero.com and, 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 yeah. uh, and uh, download yeah. it. Yeah, the trial is also available. So if you're not on 11, if you don't have a current license, you can you can test it by getting the trial version. Uh, there are a few other questions that I saw which I might answer if, if you don't mind, Jim. Um, yeah. There were actually two questions from two different people uh, about support for, for legacy processes. Uh, one oh, yeah. specifically for in processes older than with SSE2 instructions. Um, uh, to be honest, it's very unlikely we would add anything special for hardware that old today. Um, I mean, even SSC2 instructions are from, I forget exactly, 2005, earlier even, maybe. Um, 
the direction we want to go is, is adding support for, for newer and more modern instruction sets. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if the question was reversed and you want to ask something like, you know, will we add support for something like, I know, AVX or AVX2, then while we can't share plans on that, that's, that's definitely far more likely the kind of direction we would go than, than something, uh, something older. So also a question here about if the IDE is tied to the main monitoring system when debugging, um, which uh, we actually changed a few releases ago, maybe 10.4x, I, I forget the exact version right now. Uh, but there are some settings in the options dialog on the desktop and layout page that control uh, when the IDE moves around. Um, so we, as you are probably already familiar, we have different desktop layouts for uh, you know, when you're coding normally versus when you're debugging. Um, and that tends to include which window the IDE is on, but there are settings there to control more about how that works. Uh, so if you want specific functionality there to control what the IDE does when it transitions from debugging to not, then uh, check, check that out. That's the options page, uh, uh, desktops and layouts. Yeah, um, I just actually just the other day was using that. Oops, my camera turned off. I just the other day I had moved. I was doing something and somebody had to move to the other screen for something I was doing, and I went in and, and I was like, I remember David telling me about this, and I checked it, and it worked, just like you're describing. So uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. One thing we've been trying to add a lot of support for is multi-monitor displays over the past couple of years. Actually, I mean, those settings were just one part of things there. We've also done a lot of support for. Um, you're having multiple editor windows and you know, you've, you've probably seen that you can have a new edit window and um, pull the, the form designer from, from one screen to another, uh, things like that. And, and that is an area with lots of quality fixes as well, every every release. Um, yeah, this this general thing in, in approach, um, yeah, we, we definitely want to support multi-monitor. I'm always... sorry, you're about to say something. I just wanted to continue that bit. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, in continuation with that, I'd always been a big fan of running my IDE in a virtual machine, but actually switched to not doing that for the most part because of the great multi-monitor support so that it's easier to move between monitors that way. Um, uh, but you can still do multi-monitors with a virtual machine. But there's a question here. Um, I'm not sure, David, David, maybe this might be for you. Are there plans to include conditional defines in forms? Uh, we customize code for different uses, and sometimes different layouts are needed, and using frames is not an option. Uh, that is something we don't have plans for at the moment. Um, I think rather than doing something like that through the equivalent of ifdefs, we'd probably take some other approach. Um, I think it'd be the kind of thing where it'd be great to understand more about what you're doing if you can email us uh, so that we can understand the, the problem there. Um, I think currently for VCL, the social would be to uh, use an FDEF in code and then in code turn things on or off. Uh, the difference though would be for FireMonkey, where we do have the the master layout and then sort of sub layouts where you can configure and change uh, based on device. Um, but I'm I'm interpreting the question as as as, as for VCL. Yeah. Don't know if yeah, I mean, anything to add there. in general terms, I mean using. Visual form inheritance and frames, uh, so inheritance and composition visually is, is part of the VCL design and architecture. If that's not sufficient and you need something different, I'd be interested to know some of the details. I know a lot of customers have used like have their own, I mean, have application that get customized for different end user and user companies by using heavily using visual form inheritance. In a lot of places, that allows you to be much better than if devs because it, you'll get the power of inheritance and, and you can use virtual methods. You can even use virtual properties. That's a bit tricky, but it's doable. And, and a lot of things like that. Um, so th that is the mainstream way of doing it. Again, there might be roadblocks in for what you intend to do and we'll be more than happy to hear and try to see if that current technology doesn't address your needs, we can consider um, providing something new. So Carlos says, Boa tarde, Carlos, Brazil. I am actually studying Portuguese right now, so I know what that means. Boa tarde means good afternoon. So <laughs> finally gotten around to that. Uh, there's one other question here, Jim, that I, I would like to answer. 
Yes. Um, and we have hundreds of questions, by the way, and our apologies if, if we miss any. Um, uh, we, we sort of try to group them because sometimes lots of people ask similar questions and then we try to answer one that's in the same area. Uh, but you can always contact us because our, our contact details are, are up on screen. But there's one question here that, that I actually really want to address, which is to ask about um, whether the classic C++ compiler got updates specifically because of a comment, uh, most components are only compatible with it. Um, so the answer is sort of yes and no, and I want to share something about this. Um, so first of all, uh, no, C++, uh, so, sorry, Classic Compiler hasn't got any updates. Uh, we, we focus fully on Clang. But the interesting thing there is about components. Um, we've done a lot of work to ensure that source code in general is you know, compatible when it's um, uh, you know, compiled with Clang. But components have special requirements, and that was due to the RTTI that was generated. Uh, the, the Dolphy style RTTI. And it was really important when you were compiling a component with um, Clang and then installing it into the IDE uh, in several areas, but the most obvious was um, in, in, in the form design area, if you try to create an event, uh, the event handler is actually generated by the IDE by reading the RTTI. Um, and up until recently, Clang did not generate the RTTI nearly as well or as in a compatible way with, with Classic. And my, my guess is that's, that's what this question is, is referring to. Now, we overhauled that drastically, um, with huge quality effort, uh, in, I think, 11.0. Um, and so in, using components with the Clang compiler should be fantastic right now, um, definitely on, on, on par with Classic. Um, so if you had problems with that in the, in the past, then uh, you would definitely recommend trying that again in 11.x. So Ian just pointed out that uh, the Apple event starts here in three minutes now, which uh, we had moved this because Apple decided today was a great day to present as well. <laughs> and that their event is on the stage too. So uh, we will, the replay should already be available on YouTube, although we might have to supplement it because apparently uh, the uh, video I played of iOS simulator didn't go on YouTube, but uh, anyway, uh, we'll try and get some uh, blog posts, so there'll be more details coming in the near future. So stay tuned, blogs.embarcadero.com, embarcadero.com, my.embarcadero.com, and docwiki.embarcadero.com, and all our social media, and we'll have more for you. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks uh, a lot. Yeah, thanks for all the enthusiasm. A lot of people got got it installed, and they're going to town now, so that's Fantastic. It, it is truly is inspiring to see all the great stuff that everyone does with uh, these products. It uh, really is. Very much. Yes, thank you, everyone. Looking forward to uh, to talking to any of you who happen to, to contact us, but, but thanks for watching. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.